Hey ladies and gentlemen, it's Steve here. Before we get started this week, I want to let you know that on BJJ Mental Models Premium, we just launched an awesome three-part series with four-time world champ Dominica Obelinite. It's about competition and the crushing emotional pressure that can go along with it. Critical listen for anyone who's a competitor or really anyone who works in a high-stress environment. Give it a shot, premium.bjjmentalmodels.com. You can check it out and get a free trial. Give it a listen. If you don't like it, cancel with no risk. Again, premium.bjjmentalmodels.com and enjoy the show. Hey, welcome to BJJ Mental Models episode 159. I'm Steve Kwan. BJJ Mental Models is your guide to a conceptual and intelligent jiu-jitsu approach. And today... Here with a longtime requested guest, someone I've wanted to hook up with for a while, Ms. Hillary Van Ornum. Hillary, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I am also doing well. I am sitting here freezing my butt off, but you know what? I get to talk to you and I get to talk about jujitsu and that makes me happy. I'm also freezing. It's like in the 30s here in Portland today, but it's sunny, <laughs> which is unusual. <laughs> I'll take it, honestly. So, yeah, you're in Portland, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe your gym is Unicorn Jiu-Jitsu, correct? Correct. Yes, you came onto my radar because, of course, we have a lot of mutual friends, and additionally, unicorns are awesome. So whenever I see unicorns pop up on my feed, like I'm a sucker for this kind of stuff, right? Whenever Meerkatsu makes a unicorn rash guard, I'm in on it. I'm all about, like, cute neon-colored animals. So with that said... This is probably as good a time as any to turn it over to you. Why don't you give yourself a quick introduction and tell everyone who you are? I'm Hillary Van Ornum. I'm, I've been a black belt now for six years as of this past weekend, but I'm still a first degree because I don't have my stripe yet. I own and run Unicorn Jiu-Jitsu here in Portland. We are under Jiva Santana and uh, James Foster. Yeah. <laughs> but I think, I think actually this is a good point to bring up like people are like, why did you call it Unicorn Jiu-Jitsu? Do you want an explanation on that? I definitely want an explanation. So I color my hair. It's it's always like kind of rainbow colors, pink, purple. Right now it's pink with some green and purple. I've had a full on rainbow underneath. So the, I'm sponsored by Show Your Roll and Show Your Roll started just calling me the unicorn and I always have my nails painted. Like right now they're <laughs> blue glitter with some gnomes on them. So like fun stuff. And I grew up riding horses competitively. And so I've always had a thing for like horses and unicorns. I have a horse tattooed on my arm. So I've always like loved unicorns. And so Show Your Roll started calling me the unicorn. At the same time, my brother, who's a co-owner of our gym, he teaches all the kickboxing. And he's also an artist. So he drew this unicorn for me. And I was like, yes, this is what I want to be my logo. And part of the reasoning for that, this was before we opened the gym. Being a female black belt is kind of like being a unicorn. Also being a bigger female who's also strong is kind of like being a unicorn. And also like you're not supposed to be big and strong, but also be feminine. It's like you're either one or the other in, in society's view. So this was like me being a unicorn and encouraging women to be whoever they are and not like have to subscribe to certain stereotypes. So when we were coming up with names for the gym, I was like, oh, man, unicorn's going to turn people off. People aren't like, what dude is going to want to walk in and be a unicorn? And we met with a marketing company, actually. One of my old students works for a marketing company that helps large businesses come up with their kind of their story. And we talked to them and they were like, wait a minute, why don't you call this unicorn? This is going to be perfect. It's going to self-select people. You know, the the big bro douchebag that just wants to like beat the shit out of people isn't going to come into your gym. So that's great. So that's kind of how we came up with the name. My brother and my husband are the, like the three of us own it together. And they were both like, yeah, let's fuck yeah, like unicorns. And a unicorn is also like, it's very masculine. A unicorn is almost always male. They have a phallic weapon on their head. <laughs> so, Jeez, like, I never thought about this. It, okay, uh -huh. hold on, back up, because I'm not. <laughs> I'm not a unicorn biologist here. Unicorns are almost always male. How do you know that? I mean, in legend, and they're also often surrounded by women. Okay, I just I, I assumed you were like inspecting the undercarriage or something. No, no, no. <laughs> but I mean, it's yeah, this is what this is what the discussions came up with this marketing company, and they were like, actually, it like. 
make the unicorn fierce. Like, what do you want? This was a cool company. They talk about like, what's your story? Like, why, why are you doing this? And that leads me to like another side note of during this pandemic time, I've been listening to a ton of books. Jiva has suggested a few Simon Sinek books and one of them start with why. And one of the reasons we started this gym was to create an environment that I wish I had had when I came up. I was always the only woman in the, on the mats. You know, when I got my blue belt, it was the girl. I don't think he knew my name. <laughs> so I looked around and I was like, I guess that's me. <laughs> you know, I did MMA for a long time and I was the only woman in the MMA sparring room. <laughs> 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 well, you know what? I'll tell you this much. One of my favorite trends in jujitsu is the rise of cute animals that I, I would say kind of happened in, in the 2010s. When I started jujitsu, it was, you know, jujitsu was popularized primarily because of the USC. And so, of course, back in the early days, it was very much like an aggro bro culture. I remember rocking like the, the old jujitsu shirts with tribal like patterns. And literally, I had some that had like blood splatter on yep. top of them. It was the most ridiculous thing ever. And then I guess around the 2010s, and I, I suppose you can credit people like yourself and like Mirkatsu and these people realize. All of this was tremendously stupid. And now there has been this trend towards bright colored shit you know, towards cute animals, almost as like a contrarian trend. Mm -hmm. And it kind of like is a backlash to that broification of jujitsu. And I, I love that stuff. I think that there's nothing better than going and training and learning how to strangle people while you're wearing like a bright pink gi or something like that. I'm notorious at my gym for always wearing the most bright and colorful stuff I possibly can. It's funny. We had a Margo Ciccarelli was just up here. And she, when she came to our gym, I, I rolled in in a neon pink gi. Mm -hmm. And she was talking about how, like, if you saw someone like Steve, if you saw like an animal in the jungle that had a color pattern like Steve, you would get the hell away. <laughs> because, you know, these in nature, these bright, crazy color patterns usually mean back off. This is going to be dangerous for you. And I think what we want to do in jujitsu is encourage the same sort of mindset that you could be the kind of person you are. You can buck the trend. And that is one of the positive things I've seen in BJJ and the last decade or so has been a movement in that direction. Yeah. I mean, I was thinking of those t-shirts. I think there were some IBJJF t-shirts from like 2011 and 12 with like, they looked like affliction t-shirts yeah. <laughs> with the like sparkly, there was like some metallic red and one and like metallic silver and like maybe blood splatter. Not really sure. <laughs> Yeah, I, I have one of those. I had a, a Gracie Baja shirt. And of course, it being, you know, being a new blue belt, it was way too tight. It was like a skin tight rash guard for me. And it had like literally, I think it had metallic blood splatter on it. It was in retrospect, the most cringy thing I've ever owned. <laughs> yeah. So I guess back to this is why I wanted to start the gym to find like to bring people something that I wish I had had. You know, we there's a lot of gyms around the country that I've been to and, and world, actually. I've been to a few gyms in Europe where there's like a men's changing room and the women have to change in the bathroom Yep. or a closet or something like that. Everything in our gym is super like there's no gender for anything. There's changing stalls. The bathrooms are they're both they're, they're all three non gender specific. We don't even have women's class anymore. Everything is very neutral. And I think that one thing that Emily Kwok talked about, about, you know, normalizing having women in the front of the room and leading, like, why should that be different? And why should we segregate women class? And then like, wh what do you do with the guys? Like, what if there's guys that want to come and train at the same time? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And the, the other thing in Portland that we have, and like, I've talked to Jeff Shaw about this a lot, is like, what about the non-binary folks? Like, wh why do they have to choose? Like, let's just make everything open for everyone. Yeah, this is something that we've advocated for on the podcast as well, which is to – the ideal training environment is you just have one class and everyone gets along together. I understand the the need to have women's only classes. Uh, I understand why people do it. And of course, if you're trying to build a culture from the ground up and there simply are no women around, you might find that – by creating a place for women, you can make it easier to onboard them. But at the end of the day, the the utopian ideal world is that that stuff 
doesn't matter for the purposes of training, right? We should be inclusive regardless of what someone comes, what their belief system is, what kind of person they are, who they are, you know, all of that should be irrelevant to your training and to your ability to make the gym inclusive. So I think that the ideal situation is we don't have any of those concerns. But of course, I understand and respect gyms that choose to have women's only programs because at some point you have to get the momentum and you have to build a snowball. And that can be a good way to get people outside of their comfort zone and into the gym when otherwise they might not be comfortable doing so. But like you said, I think the lovely thing about your gym is right down to the marketing and the concept, inclusion is built right in from day one. Yeah. Well, the other thing that I have issue with with the women's only classes is that's typically where the female instructors are pushed to teach. They don't yeah. get to teach the the everybody class. Oh, you want to teach? Well, we'll give you a ladies class or you can teach the kids class. And that infuriates me. And that that's the situation I was in. The only way I was able to, to coach was either kids or you can start a ladies class. It was like, cool, I get it, but that shouldn't be the only place for women to be teaching, especially if they're one of the higher belts in the gym. So that's just one of my little things. We've kind of become the like the misfit, the home for the misfit toys is what we call it, which is kind of cool. Yeah, yeah. I've always found it interesting that at a lot of gyms, the assumption is that women's classes must be run by by women. And the idea of a woman running a general class is just it's still so rare unless you go to a gym where a woman was specifically the founder. It's still way too rare that you would have someone to hire a woman to run the men's class, which Mm -hmm. I think goes to show how much work we still have to do. I mean, we've come a long way, but I think there's still a lot more work to do. And the fact that female black belt instructors are still so rare is still kind of sad. That leads me to like with you're talking about, you know, women have to create their own gym to become the head coach. Something that I've seen a lot on social media, especially like the Women's Grappling Network on Facebook, which is a whole like separate discussion. (laughs) But it's interesting when people say who like what women out there own a gym. And there are so many this may sound like petty of me, but there's so many like lower belts that are like, oh, I own a gym with my black belt husband yeah. and he's the head coach, but I own the gym. Like, I, oh, okay. But you're not the head coach. And the number of female owned head coach, like run, however you want to call it, gyms out there are very small. I think you can probably count them on two hands. Yeah, I can only come up with a few. <laughs> yeah. And I understand that there's a game of catch up here, right? We're fundamentally talking about a sport where becoming a black belt takes like 10 to 12 years. So I understand that just because this started off as a a very heavily male centric sport, I get that it's going to take time before we get to a point where there's kind of a closer balance between men and women, female head instructors. But it feels like we're still so far away from that, just way too far away from that. And I get that a lot of that is just the supply of having instructors like that that you can hire. But I also feel like surely there are enough out there. I mean, I know that in BC, for example, where I live, there's not a tremendous amount of female black belts, but there's definitely enough that if you wanted to have a female black belt head instructor, you could make that happen if you wanted to. Yeah. When I, when we first opened, I was worried because my husband was still a brown belt at the time when we opened. I was worried that guys weren't going to want me to be their coach. And it's been quite the opposite. A lot of classes we have 50-50. There's a lot of classes where there's more women than men, but there's also several classes where there's like one or two women on the mat besides myself. And I I've, I found that to be really cool. Like mm-hmm. I just wasn't sure. And there's so many guys out there now that are like, I don't care. You're a badass. Like, teach me like you know what you're talking about so that's been really cool to see yeah yeah Uh, like you said there's a long way to go but i think the benefit of an environment like yours is if you self-select the type of people that are going to be a good culture fit for your gym you're much more likely to get to a happy spot there than if you have to constantly be kicking out these bad apples from your gym after they've already gotten inside right that's one of the important things about branding (laughs) yeah (laughs) It, it seems in an ideal world like you should want as many customers as you can possibly get But there is a difference between a good customer and a bad customer. And especially in a full contact sport like jujitsu, if you get a bad actor in your gym, 
holy moly, the amount of damage they can do in a short period of time is unbelievable. Yeah, that's something that Foster talks to me about a lot, especially when we were first opening was, you know, you need to interview your the potential students just as much as they need to like check you out. And so one thing we do now is we have people come in, especially if they're brand new to jujitsu and have never trained before, we have them watch a class first. Especially with pandemic times, like some people we've had before we started doing this, we had people come in and be like, oh, I didn't realize it was so like close contact. Like I have to touch someone. We're like, yeah, like <laughs> that's, that's jujitsu. So, oh, you're, you're going to be doing more yeah. than touching them. They're going to be sweating into your eyeballs. Like it's a yeah. jujitsu is really a gross sport. <laughs> yeah, it's disgusting. We're, we're disgusting humans. <laughs> I know. I mean, I love jujitsu. I absolutely love it. I think that in terms of physical activities you can do, for me, it's, I, I would recommend everyone try it at least just once. But we got to acknowledge that it's about the grossest thing that you can possibly do. I mean, I watch some of these, at least in the gi, you're wearing a pair of pajamas uh -huh. that soak up all the grossness, right? But God, I watch these no gi guys and, and these like highlight reel clips they upload on, you know, on their Instagram and, and literally they're like rolling around in a puddle of their own filth. Yeah. It's so gross. That's why I prefer the gi too. It like helps like, <laughs> and it, for women, I think it creates more of a barrier. So you're not yeah. so like body on body, but yeah. 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 And, and that's something that I think a lot of, a lot of guys, well, not a lot of guys, but all guys definitely don't understand, which is that when you're going in there and you don't know anything about jujitsu and your partner outweighs you by 50 to a hundred pounds and they're a total spaz, like, that's a really traumatic experience and it doesn't do any good to put your students in there in a, an environment like that. Right. So I think uh, and that probably ties into what we want to talk about today, which is just the perception of different body types and body sizes within the gym and how you how you make the place inclusive to everyone at the end of the day. Well, first, I wanted to talk about age. Because that's something that I've seen. We have one student that was driving about an hour each way to come and train with us. And she ended up buying a house in Portland, a second house in Portland, just so she could train with us. But the gym she was at before, she was a white belt. She's in her late 50s. They kept changing the requirements for her to get her blue belt. Oh boy. Including like doing something like a back handspring. I, I, I'm, it's probably not what it was, but it was something that like I couldn't do. And at the time that she brought this to me, I was running my first camp that I did with my two of my best friends from jujitsu, Rhonda Andrews, who probably people haven't heard of, but she is amazing. She owns her own gym in Las Vegas. She's Gracie Humaita. She's a second degree black belt. And then I always screw up her name. Marisha Mawiasiak is how I'm going to. That's how I think you're saying it now. That's we've worked on it for years. But grumpy BJJ girl. Do you know who, who that is? I, I don't. But now I need to. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody knows Marisha. And it's ridiculous. She just got third at Worlds. She should have won her division. She's one of the best women out there right now. But she's from Poland. And she's not a big name. And that's a whole that's another topic for another time. But anyway, I they're two of my best friends. We were running a camp here in Portland. This woman came to us and said, this is what they're requiring for me. Like, is this normal? And the three of us said, well, we wouldn't be black belts. We wouldn't even be blue belts right now because we can't do that physically. Mm -hmm. And this, this gym, it's like they were trying to get her to quit. And I've seen this from other people, but her specifically, they – they try to get her to quit and they just beat the shit out of her. She's also like a light featherweight. So she's in her late fifties. She's about 120 something pounds. So maybe featherweight, but you know, and, and she ended up making drastic life changes just to be able to train jujitsu. She's a blue belt now and she just got double silver at master's world. She, she damn near won her open class, but you know, providing a place for, for people like that to come, like, she's an incredible athlete. She does trapeze. <laughs> Holy moly. Like, yeah, I mean, stuff that, like, I can't do physically. But people didn't give her a chance. And I think that's ridiculous. Like, I have other, I have several athletes who are in their 50s who weren't sure that they could do this. And they're they're flourishing. You know, the people respect them and they try not to, like, crank things on them. But they also, like, don't baby them. And I think that, that we need more of that. I think there's a lot of gyms that are so focused on who can I make the next world champion? Because that's going to make me famous and that's going to get me money. Mm -hmm. And that goes back to the why are we doing this? <laughs> is yeah, it to make yeah. a lot of money or is it to help people and share like something that you love with people? 
Yeah, I kind of believe that jujitsu has a, a real ageism problem. I mean, we're, we have a lot of other problems we're dealing with at the moment, but ageism, and it's not even just jujitsu, to be fair. I mean, this happens in the workplace. This happens everywhere. But ageism is one of those things that we don't talk about enough. And and there is no denying that jujitsu is heavily catered and targeted towards younger people. I mean, I came into jujitsu when I was 25, I want to say, so I I often say like I I was the target demographic, right? Young, single, 20 something male. And I got into jujitsu. And even for me, I found it to be kind of a hostile environment. But because I was a young bullheaded idiot with nothing to lose, I just figured, you know what? I'm just going to tough this out, whatever. But the it's a very different experience if you have a lot going on in your life. You know, you've got kids, you you have your health to worry about. As you get older, you can't afford to get injured because that could impact your work. There's a lot more on the line when you're older because you have a lot more responsibilities. And we do not do a good job of making jujitsu accessible to people in that demographic. Uh, Val Worthington, when she was on the podcast, was talking about this and how, you know, you, you see all of these these young dudes go on about how they're modern day warriors and samurai and they're, you know, puffing their chests out and trying to make it sound like they're so macho. But look, if you want to talk about real courage, being a 20 something male going into a gym doesn't take that much courage. But if you're a 50 something mother of three and you want to go into a jujitsu gym, that takes way more courage than anything, <laughs> than anything that a young dude is going to do when it comes to a gym. Right. And I think that we need to celebrate exactly how hard that is for people to try something that different from what they're used to and to make it clear that this is a culture that welcomes them. Mm-hmm. And I feel like even though the the old guard is getting older in jujitsu now, I feel like we still primarily market this thing to younger people which is a a mistake, in my opinion. I I absolutely agree. And I think I'm one of the oldest. I don't I don't know if they keep records of this. Obviously, Megaton probably has like the record for the oldest black belt competing at Worlds. But like I was competing at Adult Worlds in my 40s. I turn 44 next week. But it's interesting. People often say to me or, or think about me, well, you're big and strong. So your age doesn't matter as much. And, you know, like this misconception that bigger people will always win the absolute, which this past weekend at Worlds will not help my case. But (laughs) (laughs) I've lost to lightweights uh, at Black Belt. There was, I think, 2017, I lost to Jenna Bishop in the finals of the Open at Pan Am's and Masters Worlds, Masters Masters 1. And she submitted me both times. <laughs> like she's lightweight. You know, I, I have issues with people saying, oh, you're you're so strong. Like this is something Foster talks about too, is like people will say, they'll roll with him. He's 6'5", 300 plus pounds, master's three, multiple time black belt world champion. He's kind of become my mentor over the past several years. But back on, th- this idea of... <laughs> Of course you win because you're big and strong. Or, you know, when you're rolling with somebody and people say to me or to someone bigger, oh, you're really strong. You don't tell somebody when you're rolling with them, wow, you're really flexible or wow, you're really fast. Like that doesn't typically come up. But the, oh, you're so strong. Like, is that supposed to be a compliment? (laughs) Well, I'm pretty sure it's supposed to be a backhanded insult, actually. (laughs) Exactly. And, you know, there's a lot of negative ideas. Like if you look again, the women's grappling network is one, you know, why isn't there a weight class for, for 200 pound women? There should be another weight class. And like people always want more weight classes so that they fit into their own specific weight class, but they don't realize that there's going to be no one competing in those weight classes because you're, you're it's so like separated out people making comments of like, Oh, I don't want to roll with you. You're too big. Well, have you rolled with me before? You know, it's funny you bring that up because my my brother and I have talked about this before and about how in jujitsu we kind of have a, a a big person bias in this sport, I think, where if you are if you're larger, you're kind of automatically given all sorts of handicaps and restrictions. Mm-hmm. And it's it's sor- sort of a double standard. And I, I mean, to some extent, I get it right. If you've got two completely untrained first day white belts and you <laughs> you're asking them to fight to the death, you probably need to be a little bit more concerned for the small person's safety. But once you achieve any degree of, of technical proficiency, I'm much less concerned about my safety when I'm sparring with a big person. I mean, if, if you ask me to look back at my career, 
career, most of the injuries I've had have come from people comparable in size to me. Mm -hmm. Very rarely. I can think of one time when I got a nasty cut behind my ear because I was rolling with a big guy and he tried to darse me. That's it. Every other time, like every time I've had an injury, it's been some little dude or some person my size who decided to go absolutely ballistic on me. And I think that we um, we sort of overtrain our bigger people to be gentle giants. There's there's such a stigma that we put against our bigger people where we tell them you're bigger. So you need to be slow. You need to be safe. You need to be you know, you need to take care of your partner. And we don't always hold the little guys to that same standard because we just assume that, well, they're not big. They can't possibly hurt anyone. In reality, what winds up happening from my experience is you get a lot of big people who are just terrified of rolling with little people to the, mm-hmm. to the point where sometimes they don't even engage. They just kind of sit there and don't do anything because they're so terrified. And then you also have little people who will literally throw their bodies around like cannonballs. And that's where the injuries often come from is a little person trying to do a cartwheel backflip onto your body. Right? It's, <laughs> it's usually not going to be a big person if that big person has any degree of, of body control. And it does get frustrating too, because as a smaller person, if you, if you're training jujitsu because you bought into the hype, then what you want as a smaller person is to learn how to fight up weight classes and to defend yourself against a bigger, stronger aggressor. And in order to do that, in order to learn that you need to have bigger, stronger opponents who will give you realistic resistance. And I I think the, the big person bias in jujitsu makes it such that we often train our big people to be afraid to engage with little people. And that also hurts the little people because now they're not getting a realistic training experience. Yeah, I'm okay if you don't want to roll with somebody because they make you feel unsafe. Because, oh, every time I roll with that person, they do this and it, I've gotten injured with them or whatever. But if you just don't want to roll with somebody because they're bigger, like I'm not okay with that. And I've had experiences throughout my my career even started like I did judo full time for a year early early on and I had a black belt judo woman judoka tell me like I, this is how bad it is don't squish me we were we did a lot of groundwork at this judo club which I credit to helping me get better in jujitsu but don't squish me you're a black belt like I'm a wee little green belt in judo at the time And she was only like 150, 155. It's not like she was like 100 pounds. But don't squish me. I've also had comments of other people in the gym. Like I've been in gyms where they said, get into groups of similar size and similar belt color. What the fuck am I supposed to do? (laughs) Okay, I'm a super heavyweight. I'm over 200 pounds, but I'm a black belt. Who am I supposed to go with? The, the, The ultra heavyweight blue belt dudes or the lightweight black belt men yeah or do i go with the blue belt women like and i think that going back to like a gym environment don't always group people by size i agree completely i am not a fan of the grouping by size and don't get me wrong i understand it to some extent if someone is looking to compete primarily and they're looking to compete within their own weight class i understand why you'd want to get most of your hard reps against uh, uh, something that matches that situation but i suspect that most people get into jujitsu because they want to learn to defend themselves and if that's your intent then grouping by weight classes has very limited utility to you. It can, in fact, be damaging to do that because you're denying yourself a realistic self-defense experience, right? So I get it. I get that if you're the instructor, your thought might be, okay, well, I can't keep a track of everyone and I can't keep eyes on everyone at once. So to minimize injury, I'm going to group these people by their own weight classes. But I don't know if that actually minimizes injury, right? I Like wow. I said, I have not seen a... My experience with jujitsu is that... That it is not a like a stampede of giant behemoths who are crushing little people. Usually it's people trying to do dumb shit to people the same size as them. <laughs> That's yeah. normally where injuries happen. <laughs> or not knowing when to tap or to let a sweep happen or things like that. Yeah. Yeah. But the something I wanted to talk about too is just the the damaging mental aspect of this, of you know. This would happen at at a gym I was at where get into groups of similar size and similar belt. And and I would be getting ready to compete at black belt adult. Well, what where where am I supposed to go? So I would go with the black belt dudes and they were all like, Yeah, 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 like let's let's get you ready. 
And there was this one woman who was like a purple belt at the time who would say, um, Hillary, he said, get into groups of similar size. You guys aren't the same size. She wasn't even like, I don't even think training like some of these days. And she said that comment multiple times. Obviously, still sticks with me. <laughs> these comments that you make about people, especially their size, like it, they stick with you. And you don't know what's going on in someone's life, in their health. You don't know. You don't know. So don't make assumptions that like someone's just overweight or bigger because they, they're unhealthy or they eat like shit or they're lazy. You know, I've also had a coach that told me, just put the beer down at night. Don't drink the beer every night. I'm not. <laughs> Things like that can be really damaging. And then other things of like competing. I've shown up for the open weight class. This is not at black belt, at lower belts. And had people not want to go against me because, oh, she's too big. I'm not doing it. Yeah, that's that sucks. I mean, like I said, <laughs> I I have never really, with with rare exception, been been injured by a, a big person. Now, granted, if you're going into an absolute tournament, I mean, that that's part of the risk, right? Anything can happen in that capacity. But I I do notice that in general, in jujitsu, people tend to have a, and maybe it's just because it is an individual combat sport, but people tend to have trouble projecting themselves into someone else's life situation and you talked about this earlier about how coaches look at their team so many coaches seem to just want to carbon copy themselves they want to basically do what worked for them and find other people who can follow in their footsteps and focus on those people to the detriment of everyone else i I just feel like a lot of coaches have trouble projecting beyond their own experience and looking at how their methods might be received by someone who comes from a totally different life background or has a totally different set of circumstances. And as someone who is a hobbyist myself, I definitely feel this because every gym I go to, I mean, there's always massive pressure to go and do competition. And clearly the favored people in the gym are the competitors, which is kind of weird when you consider the fact that something like 99% of your students are going to be either hobbyists or casual competitors at best. So it's weird that you're excessively focusing on the small percentage of people that you think you're going to take to the podium and you're ignoring the people who are actually paying your bills. I've never understood that. And I think a big part of that comes down to inability to empathize and inability for the coach to put themselves in the shoes of the people on their team. Yeah, I I try to make an effort to whoever is competing. I don't care who it is. They're getting my attention for like the month before a tournament. That's not to say I'm ignoring the other people, but I'm making sure that those people get the, the correct rounds that they get, that they're not going with the brand new person, especially if they're a, a blue or purple belt. But I I encourage my our students to compete because it's been such a, a great thing for me. It's how I've met most of my best friends in jujitsu. That's how I met Dominica. That's how I've met Rhonda and Marisha and and several other ladies that I, they're my best friends because we've competed against each other. And Brian and I, that's my husband, we've, we've traveled all over and made all kinds of friends just from competing. So I've tried to push everybody to compete at least once a belt. That's my goal for everyone. Just to also test themselves. It's another way of training. It's a way of seeing like where you are. Like getting ready for a tournament, like there's, especially lately, there's, there's been such few tournaments, at least here in the Pacific Northwest, but I really, it doesn't matter who it is. It doesn't matter if, if I think they're going to win gold or I, I don't think they're going to win a match. Like I put all my effort into those people, no matter who they are, because they deserve it. They're putting themselves out there. So yeah. that's, I look at the competitors a little bit differently. Like I don't, I actually spend less time with the people that I think are going to do well <laughs> and focus a little bit more because I, I don't want it. I want it to be a positive experience. I don't want them to go out there and be like, oh, I'm never doing that again. Yeah. And it's funny because we're getting into, there's a tournament coming up late January. So we're starting to prepare for it now. And I'm, I'm like, you guys need to push yourselves a little bit more. <laughs> You're not in good enough shape. Like, come on. We got like, I have a little bit higher expectations for the people that are going out there to compete, but more so that they give themselves the best opportunity to have the best results that they can and that they don't come out of it disappointed or going, oh yeah, I really should have listened to Hillary more. I really should have trained a little bit more or harder. So while we're on this topic, Hillary, something that might be tangential to this and worth discussing, when we're talking about inclusivity in jujitsu, what about different body types? Because I find that Many people, when they provide instruction or advice, it's usually geared towards people who have 
similar dimensions and limitations to themselves. So for example, a lot of big guys will give techniques that might not make a lot of sense if you're small and vice versa. I'd like to get your understanding on just the relationship between jujitsu techniques and teaching and the different body types that everyone can have. Yeah, I think one thing we try to do is modify techniques for all body types, ages, and physical abilities. So I'm a 5'10", super heavyweight. My husband is 6'3", and he's middle heavy. So we're like not small people, but we try to address things in like, like, okay, so say you're shorter, this sweep might actually be better for you. I don't personally do this, but this might be better for you. And another example that I always try to do is like, for example, triangles. With shorter or thicker legged people, it's hard to finish a triangle, like with the traditional sense of putting that foot behind your knee. And like a lot of people can't get that or they can't grab their shin. So I always tell people, grab the inside of your own pants. That's totally legal. That's something that should be accessible to you. So try to grab that. And maybe that'll help your triangle. And the number of times I've done that at like seminars or like women's camps and the women that are like, oh, my God, that just blew my mind. Like, it's a little sad to me that no one else has like thought to tell them that or they just think, oh, I can't do triangles like my body's not meant for it. So I think you need to when you're teaching, try to like look around the room in particular and instructional is different because, you know, you don't know who's watching. But I think in a class or a seminar or anything like that, you need to be able to look around the room and like recognize, oh, okay, maybe these people need a little bit extra help. And the other thing I think that you really need to, as an athlete and as a coach, you need to help find your own like strengths and weaknesses for your own body type. I think there's benefits to every size and shape. So try to find that. And that leads me into like, there's a difference between being an instructor and a coach. And I think that a lot of people don't think about that. You know, instructing is like teaching someone a technique, but coaching someone is far more than that. You need to help like people find their strengths and have them ask questions and not just like, this is how you do it. And this is the only way to do it. But coaching is just so much more. And I find that that's like something that I am better at is coaching than just teaching a technique. Yeah, I love that idea of calling out the difference between an instructor and a coach. I've never thought of that before, but you're completely right. An instructor's job is just to transmit knowledge from themselves to the other person. And in jujitsu, your body type and your strategy makes such a difference to what you are or aren't going to do. And we don't talk about this enough. The, the viability of some moves changes dramatically depending on your body type and your opponent's body type. And I think sometimes when we... When we teach techniques, or at least when we instruct people, we don't really make it clear what that difference is and what the limitations of these are. And so we kind of set it up in in people's heads that, well, this technique should work for everybody. And if you can't make it work, then you're just doing it wrong. And that's probably true to some extent. (laughs) But, But the reality is mechanics matter, right? If you have big, long, strong legs, you're going to have a much easier time locking up a triangle than if you have short, stubby legs. If you have big, long arms, you're going to have a much easier time getting head and arm chokes than if you have shorter arms. That's just mechanics, right? And it's important to call out that a coach is doing more than just transmitting knowledge. They're helping guide a person to be the most effective version of themselves. And that means helping them find things that play to their strengths, which is a different consideration necessarily than when you're creating an instructional and it's going to be viewed by a bunch of different people and you don't know all of those people independently. So you can't really custom tailor to their game. But I think that's important to understand that when you're receiving technique from a lot of instructors, they might not necessarily be tailoring that to you so that it's maximally efficient. And I think that if you want to be really successful over the long term, then you need to have someone who goes beyond just instructing you and actually coaches you based on the things that are likely to be effective for you. Yeah. And I think like nothing feels worse than going into a gym and feeling like you don't belong because you can't do the thing that they're showing. Our job as jujitsu coaches is to make people feel like they're important, that they belong, that like how they can make jujitsu work for themselves. And if as me as a coach, if people have a good attitude and they're willing to try, that's all I can ask for. As long as I'm giving them, here's some ideas. There's, And it's not even like just long legs, short legs, rounder bodies. It's older bodies. There's certain people, like I have some students that are in their 50s that it, their knees are not good anymore. So I have to modify like how to do a single leg. Like maybe you don't need to drop down to your knee to do that. Like let's figure out different ways to make this work for you. 
And that's yeah. really one of the reasons we started Unicorn Jiu Jitsu was to show people that they're capable of more than they thought they were and to realize that they're strong and that everybody can be an athlete. You don't have to be 22, zero body, well, you know, minimal body fat percentage, super strong. You don't have to be that to be an athlete. Like anybody can be an athlete. And we just really wanted to help people like become the best versions of themselves. And one of our little taglines is we, we are creating a safe place for violence. <laughs> which I think is, I don't know, it's like my husband came up with that and it's so true because I'm constantly monitoring the room of like, is everyone being safe? Are you having a good time? Did you learn something today? We're asking a lot of people for questions after classes. And that's something that my head coach, Diva Santana, leaves room at the end of his classes for questions like, okay, you guys just rolled. What came up? And it's not like a bad thing to ask questions. We're still trying to get them more used to asking questions. But please ask your coaches questions. If they're good coaches, they should answer or try to help. But if you don't know the answer, go find someone who does and don't tell them like, oh, well, I know. I think that's another problem we see in this sport is people are afraid of their students beating them, of not knowing an answer to something, not being an expert on everything. And I tell you, when I thought when I like back when I was a blue belt, especially when I kind of understood what jujitsu was, I thought that by the time I was a black belt, I would know everything. And I don't. <laughs> yeah, exact same thing here. I kind of assumed that jujitsu was just this collection of knowledge and that the process of getting to black belt was just you learned and you mastered all of those different things. But what I understand now is you just simply cannot master every aspect of jujitsu. No. It's not possible. You have to carve out your own niche. It's sort of like a... Oh, God, I hate to compare this to getting a doctorate because it's... I know, I know. ...not like it at all. I, and that's such a stupid comparison for reasons I don't want to get into. But it's like how, you know, when you get a doctorate, that doesn't mean you know everything in an area. It means that you've carved out a niche and you're a specialist and a, a knowledge expert in that one area. And in jiu-jitsu, I just, I feel like it's not realistic to expect people to become an expert in every single aspect of the sport. And I think one of the beautiful things about jiu-jitsu is that you can pick and choose the pieces that make jujitsu what you want it to be. People often ask me why I don't have cauliflower ears because I've been training for so long. And the answer is pretty simple. It's because I don't let people hit me in the head. My entire game is predicated on the fact that I want to protect myself. So I don't use techniques if they're likely to result in some sort of blunt force trauma to my head. I don't shoot doubles. If I shoot singles, I only shoot low singles. And I've just kind of tailored my game towards this. So if a move has the possibility of me getting clocked in the face, I'm probably not going to do it. That's not to say those moves don't work. And if you're going out there and you want to compete, you know, you use what tools will get help you win. So I'm not saying these moves don't work, but I'm just saying for me, for what I want out of jujitsu, I've just filtered those things out of my game. Uh, similarly, a lot of the the grabby grabby stuff you do in the gi where you like tie up in people's sleeves. I don't like doing that. It's too hard on the fingers. It's not that it doesn't work. Other people love doing it, but I like my fingers more than I like spider guard. So I don't play spider guard, right? You don't have to do everything. All you do have to do is make sure that you're at least aware of all of the things that other people can do to you and you can counter and defend against those. But you yourself don't need to be a master in executing those techniques. Yeah, absolutely. And something else we, we're trying to do, and this kind of, it started with Dominica of we're having people come in black belts and I'm calling it a black belt in residency. So it's like an artist in residency, but they're black belts in residency. And I'm bringing in people that have totally different games than me to help expose our students and myself to different techniques, different ways of moving. The next one I'm going to bring is Nikki Sullivan, who is completely different from me. She like folds in half and goes upside down, which I try to avoid at all costs. But maybe some of my students can get benefit from that. And we had Dom here for two months, which was amazing. We learned so much and our students learned so much. And I don't know if our students realize the caliber of training they got with her. You know, some of our students are like, oh, cool, there's a visiting black belt. Like, who is this person? Because they, they just started <laughs> training and they don't know. And I kept having to say, like, she is probably one of the, if not the best women in jujitsu. Like, <laughs> so I, I don't think people understand this, right? I mean, Dominica is a 10 time overall world champion, a four time black belt world champion. She's won championships consecutively. Yeah. She won her first world championship at 14 years old in yeah. the adult division. I mean, 
Dominica for Hall of Fame, right? I don't yeah. understand why she doesn't get more attention for her track record. I mean, if you uh, just when you say that someone has won 10 world championships for the black belt level, they won their first at 14. I'm, that kind of stands out. I don't know the last time she's lost a match. My goal for when she was here was I was going to pass her guard. You're going to make her lose in front of your students. No, 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 no. I just wanted to pass her guard one time. That was my whole goal. And then I have some herniated discs in my lower back and I wasn't able to really train. And she was afraid to like sweep me overhead because of my back or have me bent over. So we didn't really get to train very hard, which was really disappointing. But that was like my whole goal was to pass her guard legitimately one time. (laughs) <laughs> and, I, and no one did while she was here, even my husband. I had no idea how big Dominica was because she uh, had that. Sem- she's not that big. <laughs> she's tall. She's, she's tall. tall though, right? I mean, <laughs> I had no idea because I saw that I, she was posting photos of her uh, with Emily Kwok and a bunch of the others, and she towers over all of these people. Yeah. I had no idea she was that tall. Yeah, I'm five ten. So she's five, like five eleven. Like we're Jeez. yeah. You guys tower over me. I'm like five. I don't even know, but. Hey, all I know is that at my size and my body type, I don't try to play height based games. I want to get scooch underneath people. That's easier. When you're small, getting smaller is usually the the path of least resistance, if you ask me. But even Dom will scoot underneath you. God damn it. Yeah. She (laughs) she can play my game too. That's not good. Even she had to modify techniques because she's so flexible too. Mm -hmm. Like her hips and her legs just move. Like there's not a whole lot of people who move like her, but she had to say, okay, yeah, here, let's, let's adjust this thing for you that, you you know, the 50 something year old that doesn't, you know, has arthritis and can't move like me. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know this, this idea of, I think it's going away, but of the, you know, you can't go anywhere else. They're going to steal your knowledge from you. You can't learn from other people. I think that's going away, but I'm really trying to push to learn from everyone. Yeah. So, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I, I think that this whole area of custom tailoring jujitsu to you and to your goals is such an underdeveloped part of the sport, right? We talk about techniques and tactics like they're interchangeable, but they're not. People always draw this comparison between jujitsu and chess. I was just talking to John Thomas about this on a prior episode, and something that I brought up with him is, yes, I can see the parallels between jujitsu and chess, but the difference is in chess, If you move your pawn two steps forward, it doesn't matter who did that. It doesn't matter if it's me or Gary Kasparov, right? A pawn moving two steps forward is always a pawn moving two steps forward. But in jiu-jitsu, every individual person doing a technique is different, right? You doing a triangle on someone is totally different from me doing a triangle on someone. It's not interchangeable. And one of the things that I love about jiu-jitsu is how we can tailor it and customize it to people based on their attributes and their goals. One of the best things about the sport in my mind, and we just don't talk about that enough. Yep, I agree. And I, I think this is very much a challenge that we have in the jiu-jitsu landscape. There, there's sort of a prime demographic for jiu-jitsu that this whole sport was primarily originally, I'd say, marketed towards, which is kind of young men. And we still don't do a very good job of engaging or onboarding people who fall outside of that demographic. And so I think the challenge is what you're explaining here is exactly what I think a lot of us have seen, uh, which is unfortunately that if you don't fall right into that prime demographic, you just don't get the attention and you're kind of looked at like a like a second class person, which is really sad. Yeah. And I don't know if I already said this with my, about my competitors, but I, I try to, no matter who it is, make sure they're each getting what they need to, to prepare and, and be as prepared as possible to have the best outcomes possible, no matter if they're going to win or if they're not going to win a match. Like, it doesn't matter to me. They're getting my attention. So with that said, I mean, as a gym owner, what can you do if you're, you know, if you're running kind of what I guess you'd consider a standard jujitsu gym and you're encountering these problems? I mean, most most gym instructors likely want to expand their student base, but how would you do it? How do you cater towards people who are older, people who have different body types, um, people who might otherwise, you know, people who might be disenfranchised? How do you cater to these people and create an inclusive environment? What are the gyms failing to do right now that they should be doing? I think they're ignoring these people. You know, especially like the older or the bigger and and it's kind of interesting. I don't I don't know how to like cater to them or to get them in the door, but once they come in the door, I try to make sure everyone is treated equally, no matter their belt level, their size, their athleticism. There's gonna be times with like if you have a young former wrestler that walks in the door, I actually don't 
help them as much because they they know what they're doing more. I help them with their jujitsu aspect, but they know how to move their body and they know how to, you know, sprawl, for example, when someone who's never done any sports before can come in and be like, a what? A, a, what is like they don't understand even the terminology or the, the basics of moving their bodies. But I just try to make sure everyone feels welcome and comfortable. If they're brand new, I make sure they're matched up with somebody who at least knows something because there's some classes where we have a people that have been training, everyone's been training less than a year. So there's some people that, you know, are a little bit more advanced than others, but I just try to make sure they, they feel welcome and, and like they understand what they're doing. Cause that's another thing is you walk into a gym sometimes and it, a brand new person and you, t- you shrimp and they're like, what is that? Make them feel like they have a clue of what's going on. Yeah. So something that I think is a fundamental problem with jujitsu, at least the way that it was originally started off, you know, just from a marketing standpoint, jujitsu originally was a sport that I would say, and I think we can agree, the original target market was young men, right? That was kind of the prime demographic for what jujitsu was catering towards. And it's expanded and opened up a lot since then. But I feel like we still are are so focused on that prime demographic. I feel like we don't do a great job of making jujitsu inclusive to people beyond that. And I, I'd love to get your perspective on this in terms of what needs to be done within the jujitsu landscape to make this a more welcoming place for people who aren't just 20 something men. You know, if you want to bring in people who are older, they have families, maybe they're, you know, they're a minority that isn't normally found at the gym. Like how do we go about making jujitsu more of an inclusive thing for everybody because ultimately i would think that most gym owners would agree we all benefit if more people and more different types of people do jujitsu absolutely i'm still trying to figure out how to get them in the door but i'm trying to make sure we treat everybody with respect and like they're equals when they walk in the door i think one thing we can do is to like for our gym we post pictures my husband takes all the pictures and then he edits them but he makes sure to include pictures of everybody, not just the ripped young athletes, uh, or they're all athletes, but does that make sense? Like to, to take pictures and to use pictures of everyone, not just the people that is the prime demographic. And I think something else that we can do, this is, this was a, a topic I had was like, well, if we get time to talk about this or if this comes up, but we really sexualize women in jujitsu. And if you look at like, on Instagram in particular, a lot of the women jujitsu photos are not jujitsu. Yeah. <laughs> and they're a lot of like sexy photos. And maybe if we stop promoting those, I, I there's a lot of room and it and room to work on by everyone for that kind of idea of like like if you look at pictures, if you're if you're a let's say a 55 year old grandmother who thinks, you know, I I think I want to try this jujitsu thing. I've always been an athlete, but this looks interesting. And then they go on online and they look at pictures. They're like, oh, these are all 20 something year old girls in phenomenal shape. I can't do that. Why don't we try to normalize pictures of everybody doing jujitsu? Yeah, I, I would I would agree. <laughs> this is actually something that I often tell people about when they're looking for a new gym, which is go to the gym's website that you're considering and look at the pictures of the people they choose to put on their website. Look at the stock photos, look at the pictures that they they promote with. Are these all pictures of young dudes on the podium? Or are you seeing families? Are you seeing children? Are you seeing a broader demographic of people on there? Because that is a very good indicator for what kind of culture you're, you're going to walk into, right? If you go to, if you go to a gym website and it's nothing but competition photos, you're going into a competition gym and that might be what you're looking for. It might not be, but it's important to know that out of the gate that not all gyms target the same kind of audience and they're not all created equal, right? Yeah. And I think the idea of having stock photos, like everyone can go take a picture now with your with your phone (laughs) why are you having stock photos there's a lot of gyms out there that only have stock photos i think that should be a red flag too but yeah i'm i mean i'm if if anyone has ideas of how to get a wider variety of people into the gym doors please like let me know because i'm I'm working on it a couple ideas we've had i don't want to say anything about the pandemic as far as like it you know being on the downturn but i hope reaching out to some groups that are are not represented in jujitsu you know my brother worked at strip clubs in portland like portland has a ton of strip clubs i'm about getting maybe some of those people on the mats to help 
maybe protect themselves or give them something else to do instead of like going to a bar after work. There's other, like, I would love to figure out how to get trans people doing jujitsu more because I think that's hard for them to walk into the door of a very like masculine sport and try to try to jump in, especially if you have these women's only classes or, or you, you have the segregation of sexes. Yeah. It's that's something I'm working on of trying to figure out how to reach out to more people and make them feel comfortable coming in. Yeah, I would, man, when I look at the kind of shit that I see people put in the jujitsu community post on social media, I would not blame any trans person for steering clear of this community, right? It's unfortunately it, we're not ready yet, I think, as a community, and we need to do a better job of making our community welcome to trans people, uh, or re really, actually, just anyone in general outside of the demographic, like I said. And, and I think a lot of that comes down to the way that we market ourselves. I think that, like you said, a better use of who we choose to promote, even going down to things as basic as the photos that you put on your gym website. All of this very clearly spells out bits and pieces of, of your culture. And I think it also comes down to who we as a community choose to give press to. If you are, for example, I mean, I, I guess a perfect and timely example is Cyborg just competed at the IBJJF, right? Why? Mm -hmm. Why was yeah. that allowed? <laughs> Why on earth did we allow that? I mean, I get that he is this incredibly accomplished competitor, but don't we have any kind of moral compass that we can stand on in this community? Why are we allowing that? As long as we allow this kind of stuff, we're we're sending a very clear signal to people about what kind of community jujitsu is. And of course, a lot of a lot of groups are going to self-select out of that once they see and hear this kind of thing. I mean, the biggest press that jujitsu got in years was Cyborg getting featured in the New York Times in not a good way. <laughs> and, yeah. and this is the legacy that non-grapplers are thinking about and seeing when they see jujitsu. This is what they know about it, right? It's not a good look. And I think that the way that perhaps we can counter that is just by flooding the space with positivity and positive images and inclusive images and hopefully eventually steering the ship so that people like cyborg don't have a place here yeah i mean i think it's going to be hard to not allow him to compete but i think you know this the celebration especially after masters worlds this past year because i think he double golded and they're celebrating him mm -hmm. what <sighs> I don't see why it's so hard to not to ban someone like that from competing. I mean, in any other sport, if you had someone with that kind of history, it would be a pretty open and shut matter to just not have that person compete or not have that person invited. But in jujitsu, we we act like this is a big thing to, you know, to to hold an athlete accountable for their conduct. We act like this is this big, unreasonable thing that we shouldn't have to do. And I just I think that we need to be more aggressive about weeding this kind of stuff out. I think it's going to just be hard without having, I, I know you've talked about this before, but like not having a governing body other than the IBJJF to really monitor, restrict, enforce these types of things. But I think the one thing we can do now is to not celebrate these people on social media. Yeah, I think that's that's a bare minimum thing that we can, we should all be able to agree on, which is that we should just I mean, I don't want to have people like that in my social circles, right? I don't want to be following people like that. I don't want to see it in my feed. I've tried to start being really aggressive about curating down who I follow on social media. I try to restrict it down to people that I know and people that I, I respect and admire. And I I think that giving people like Cyborg Oxygen, because pretty clearly from looking at his recent posts, pretty clearly he feels that he's the victim in this whole thing. And that really just... It just it, it's infuriating, right? It's just it's such a bad look for the sport. There's there's no contrition. Clearly, there just it's not something that I think he is really taking as seriously as he should. And unfortunately, he's being in, enabled to do that, and that creates a ripple effect where we're, we're sending a message about the type of culture that jujitsu is, and it's going to be hard to change it as long as we've got players like that in the space. Yeah, and I think you know the fact that I, I heard you talk about this before, but like that Lloyd Irvin is still there. Yeah, he's still there. I, I had people tell me that they were at Worlds at like a few weeks ago and they yeah. saw Lloyd Irvin there and he's just there hanging out doing his jujitsu thing. And man, that's a that's a problem that should have been resolved about eight years ago. But yet it's it's amazing what gets swept under the bridge, right? It's amazing what in this community we tolerate and we we forgive. It just doesn't make sense to me.
Yeah, I think, I mean, we can do things also like not support seminars or, you know, seminars by their students who are still supporting them. But that's, it's, I don't know, I think seminars and like who people support on, on social media in particular is, it's funny. Who who gets, you know, oh, everybody goes to see this one person, but there's known that this person has slept with students, has been inappropriate, like they're, you know, has been inappropriate with people, but people still, well, their jujitsu is great. <laughs> I always find that to be such a, a bizarre argument. So, I mean, you're, so you're saying that this awful person who may be a violent predator is really good at being a violent predator and you want to learn from them. I mean, it's just, it's such a weird inversion of priorities. Yeah. And I, I, I struggle with this. And I think also being a female black belt who's been around for a long time. I and mean, we've, I've heard stories about big names that I'm like, seriously, like how, how are people still supporting these people? And I guess that's a, a good thing for me is that I haven't been around any of these big, big names. I mean, Jiva Santana is as biggest name that I've had as a coach. And he is like one of the most like wholesome, good humans that I've ever met. And I don't think he would stand for any of this, but yeah, I just, I don't, under, I don't understand. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I mean, to me, I think that when it comes to inclusivity, that's one of the big things that is still a barrier is, is, you know, as, as they say, I, who's, uh, there's a great quote that a uh, culture isn't what you preach. It's what you tolerate. I think it's Leif Babin who said that. And that's exactly true. You know, we can talk about being inclusive all day long, but at the end of the day, the, the bad behavior that we as a community tolerate that dictates the fence where, where the line is going to be, where people are going to be kept out on the other side. Right. And it, I think it's up to us to stand a little bit more firmly against that bad conduct, because then we can start truly making the place more inclusive. So I, I think that's a big part of what actually will help the the equation is just hopefully one day these these guys being held a bit more accountable than they have been historically. Well, and the people around them. Yes. I mean, I I don't I don't know Maggie, but I'm outraged that she hasn't said anything about what's happened at Fight Sports. There's a lot. Yeah, it's been quite surprising how quiet people are. Uh, and I, again, that's very, very telling. I, there's there's a lot of people who just, you know, they're always posting their thoughts on social media. But then as soon as it comes down to cy cyborg, some that they probably know quite well, just immediate silence, there's no comment, not even a statement made about it. And I understand that, you know, not you shouldn't be forced to make a public statement about everything that happens in the world that if you may or may not have been directly involved in. But at the same time, I mean, I think that if if you're being silent about these things and then you just go back to liking the dude's posts and commenting and calling him a great warrior, like you're fuck, you're 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 really just enabling at that point. Right. You're clearly demonstrating that you didn't take this that seriously in the first place. So, yeah, uh, it's it's a challenge that I think we have to we're all going to have to face and overcome together somehow. I think it's it's. I'm baffled that you guys, that you, Dom and Emily have gotten like such horrible response to your podcast that you did a few months ago like I, I don't see where anything in there was offensive or wrong or like nobody called anybody out by name at all and I'm just there were a lot of really angry dudes <laughs> about that conversation. I personally thought it was a totally non-controversial discussion. Yeah. We really just had Emily and Dom on to share their their private opinions, you know, about their own personal experiences. They didn't name anyone by name. No. And there, were, there was a lot of pushback on that. And that was really disheartening, actually. I mean, I, I thought I was doing a favor to some friends of mine. I thought I was uh, using this little platform that we have to give them a place to speak about a really important issue. And I thought this was going to be one of those things that would be a slam dunk, right? It shouldn't be controversial to say that sexual harassment and sexual abuse are bad. That should really not yeah. be controversial. But the amount of negative pushback I got on that was really, really disheartening, honestly. But that said, though, then that created kind of a wave of counter pushback where other people came yeah. back and pushed back on those people. So there is still good in the world. But it was, yeah, it was an odd experience for sure. I definitely did not expect that. And I mean, I feel like those two could tell detailed stories of, of horrible things that they've witnessed or have had happened to them that, you know, they didn't even go into that and people mm -hmm. are still upset. I, I don't, 
I think like what Dom said about like, it's uh, what do men want? These, these particular men th that are so angry about this, like, do they, what do they want to do with women? Do they just not want women to train or do they just want them to be, you know, people that they sleep with or they, they date or whatever? Like, it I don't, it doesn't make any sense to me. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm hesitant to try to speculate because I, I mean, there's so many people out there who have different opinions. I don't know what goes through these people's heads, but I think a lot of it is, just this feeling that, well, I'm not that type of person. Yeah. You know, I think people feel that when when people like Dom and Emily come out and talk about the stuff that maybe the intent was to paint a broad brush, which was absolutely not the intent. Quite clearly, Emily and Dom are talking about very specific experiences. But I think a lot of a lot of men hear that and they almost took it as a personal attack, even though it had nothing to do with them, which I think is telling that dudes would just think every conversation is about them, even if it's not. <laughs> yeah. But that was I think that was a big part of it. I th And I think another big part is, you know, people people love jujitsu in a way that is uncommon for hobbies, right? People will start jujitsu and before they even get their blue belt, it's consumed their whole lives and they've changed their Instagram handle. So it's got BJJ in the handle, right? I mean, it's a very consuming sport. And I think people don't like to hear bad things being said about something they love so much and perhaps people that they, they idolize. I mean, right? No one wants to hear that their hero did something awful. So I think these kinds of conversations can be unwelcome because so much of the way that we market jujitsu Jitsu. We make it act like it is this magical cure for everything. You know, it'll cure you. We t you'll see people say things like jujitsu is therapy. It'll cure your depression. Just ridiculous claims. We love to talk up jujitsu, but we don't like to be critical of it. And, and I think that whenever someone has cr something critical to say immediately that that gets shot down. And that's unfortunate. Well, and I think this was something I was going to talk about earlier, but I think when concerns are raised within a gym or an organization that they need to be listened to. And there's been times in the past where I've brought things up that I didn't think were right happening where I was. And I was either told it's not that, that doesn't concern you. Don't worry about it. You're getting involved where you don't need to be involved. You're causing drama because, you know, women cause drama. And then I was even told by one place, if you don't like what's happening here, then you can just leave. That's fine. We're not changing. And that that place, a lot of people left and it's not the same place it used to be. But, you know, like if if you're a leader of a gym or even a, like just a coach, I think you need to listen to what your your students are telling you. If there's something, if there's if there's a person who's doing some like kind of creepy things with with ladies or just being inappropriate or rolling too hard or always, you know, doing their own thing and not following directions like that needs to be brought to the whatever the organization is the gym and it needs to be dealt with and not just like pushed aside like oh it's just you're being dramatic or you're causing trouble i think that needs to be listened to yeah it's you know and, and this goes beyond just any conversation about inclusion really but just more about how you can make your gym a good welcoming place because i i do sort of feel like a lot of the times instructors don't want to they don't want to step up and create a scene and they definitely don't want to kick out someone who's paying them which i think is a big part of it right and so when you have someone who is for example a mat bully or they're doing something untoward in the gym a lot of instructors immediately go on the defensive because number one, they don't want to, you know, they don't want to create headaches for themselves. And they foolishly think that by doing nothing, the problem will go away, which it never does. No. Um, and then number two, of course, they don't want to go against their own pocketbook. If you start kicking out students, their immediate concern is that's costing me money. Whereas in reality, what they probably don't realize is if you allow negative environments to live in your gym, they're going to do unbelievable amounts of damage. And yeah. one of the best things that you can do as an instructor is if someone in your gym is doing something that is counterculture like you know they're and i'm not even talking about anything discriminatory but just someone being a mat bully just someone who's a yeah. really awful training partner if you talk to them about it and they won't fix their ways they won't change their ways you've got to understand that that one person is probably scaring off dozens of other potential customers for you you're yep. only hurting yourself if you allow your gym to be overtaken by negative elements and if you allow that to go on for too long then you wind up in a situation like we've seen 
way too frequently recently, right? Uh, and you don't want to be that person. You don't want to have news stories written about your gym in that light. <laughs> so I think that one of the highest duties of a, of a leader and a gym leader in this case is that they have to make sure that they sanitize their gym of toxic elements, right? If there are people who are intentionally being bullies or they're doing things that are criminal, negligent, or otherwise problematic, you have to solve those problems, whether it be talking to those people or if you have to escalate and eventually remove them. It takes a lot of courage to do that, but you got to do it, right? That's what being an instructor is all about. Well, and I think you just, you have to open yourself up to like, am I maybe not doing the best job I can? Like what, if you hear negative feedback about somebody or something happening, you need to listen to it and not just instantly dismiss it. I think, you know, some of these toxic environments have been because the the leaders of whatever the gym or association have blinders on and think that they're right. Their ways the way, especially if they've been in business for a long time and they've been around a long time. It's always been like this. It's never been a problem. Mm-hmm. Like we just, you need to be open to changing. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, there's, you have to be a little bit humble and you have to just be open. You know, a, a, another little thing that I've been working on on myself is I've been listening to a lot of Brene Brown books <laughs> and she brings up this really interesting concept in this book I'm listening to right now of, is everyone really doing the best that they can? It's a good question. Uh-huh. My instant reaction was, hell no. Mm-hmm. No, people are lazy, they're slacking, but I think we need to keep that idea in the back of our head. And if you if you assume that people are doing the best they can, you're going to be a little bit happier. Yeah. Like you're going to not assume the worst, but you have to, as a gym owner, you have to, instead of being like, well, they're, they're trying hard. You need to like take a serious look at it and be objective and not automatically assume that things are okay. Yeah. And I mean, I, I am sympathetic to the situation, uh, to the plight of the gym owner here, because the reality is most people who start a jujitsu gym don't have decades of management experience where they know how to deal yeah. with these problems, right? It's mostly people who are hyper passionate about jujitsu, who quit their day job to do jujitsu. And they didn't ever expect to get into an environment where one of their students was being sexually harassed or where, you know, in, in a worst case scenario, maybe the perpetrator is even a friend or an employee of theirs. Mm-hmm. And and I think we have to understand that that is a very difficult situation for someone to be in. And we're talking about people who aren't trained to deal with these kinds of problems. So, yes, I, I understand that for a lot of these people, I mean, I'm sure that in his mind, Cyborg was thought he was doing the right things and was doing the best that he could. So I think it's important to bear in mind that I doubt a lot of these people are intentionally being malicious when it comes to the way they run these organizations. But just there is a weakness of leadership in a lot of places where they simply just through lack of courage or experience didn't have the the temerity to stand up for the right thing and to, to purge their gym of negative elements. And I think it's fair to criticize people for that, even if they in their own mind they were doing their best. We can I'll still do better, right? I mean, this is a problem that will probably go on forever, but it is yeah. hopefully a problem that we can we can shrink dramatically if we're aggressive about it. Well, I think you can assume that they're doing the best, but if they don't make the changes, if they don't yeah. listen to the complaints, then they're not. You have to you have to be open to criticism and and listen. And and the other thing, like it's funny with with the past year or I guess year and a half of COVID. A year ago, I didn't know if our gym was going to survive, and I was worried about the numbers. Now we're over 100 members, which I know is kind of like a a gold standard. Like, okay, once you've hit 100, like you're you're good. I still can't quit my my full time job yet, Mm -hmm. but we're we're less concerned about the numbers and we're more concerned about the quality of people. And I think if you're constantly concerned about your bottom line or like what the number is and how how much you're making every month, and that's you're in it for the wrong reason. You need to look at the the whole of what you're creating and what you have and not just numbers or money. Yeah. yeah. And I'm sympathetic, of course, because you got to pay the bill. So I, I get the plight that our leaders are finding themselves in where they have to balance all of these variables. But at the end of the day, you did sign up for this, right? If you open the jujitsu gym, regardless of whether you have the skill set to do that properly, you did sign up for this. So it is your responsibility now to make it work. Man, that's a lot. Was there anything else that we didn't get into that you wanted to cover, Hillary? We talked about quite a bit, but I know you had a lot of items on the docket. No, I think, I mean, I think that's it. I think my biggest points were how to create a welcoming environment for everyone. 
and that we can make jujitsu for everyone and every body. And it doesn't have to be for the specific, you know, targeted demographic that if you do all the right things and you create the right environment, the people will come, the money will come, the numbers will come. You don't have to keep everyone just to keep everyone. You need to create the right environment. And, you know, I think we survived COVID because we were willing to listen to our members and what they wanted. We've been more cautious than other gyms in Portland with the masks and with training pods and things like that. I think that's like, that's what our people wanted. So that's what we did. And if you do the right things and you do it for the right reasons, the people will come. Yeah. And you know, what saddens me a lot is that a lot of people, when they hear conversations like this, they will think that this con- type of conversation is political or or something like that. Or this is like the BJJ woke cast, which is not my intent to create. But like, I really just, I really feel like we should be able to make this inclusive without turning it into a discussion about politics or anything, right? I mean, the, the beauty of jujitsu, the reason I got into this, it was sold to me as the, the martial art for everyone. I was told that you don't have to be big, strong, athletic to be an effective fighter and that jujitsu is for everyone. That to me is the thing I love about jujitsu. You can be a non-violent, non-warrior, just regular person who just wants to learn how to protect themselves and you can make it happen and you don't even have to hurt the other person. You can do it safely. And the beauty of jujitsu is it lives up to that marketing, right? It's not some BS fake martial art. It actually does that. But we need to make sure then that we maximally market this to all of the people who could benefit from it. And I just don't think we do that, right? I don't think it has to be a political statement. I really hope that people don't turn it into that kind of statement. But really, I just think that the beauty of jujitsu is that once you walk in the door and get on the mats, all of your other identities should be left behind, right? It shouldn't matter. It should be an open, welcoming place for everyone. And I just hope that we can get there. I think we have a ways to go. We've made a lot of progress, but I think we still have a quite a few more steps that we have to undertake to get there. Absolutely. And it's funny, I am like the most non-political person because I feel like my personal politics are all over the board. <laughs> so this is not a political statement. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Hillary. I greatly appreciate it. If people want to check out Unicorn, or if they want to follow you on social or otherwise find out about you, how, get in touch with you, how do they go about doing that? My personal Instagram is unicorn underscore jujitsu. And then our gyms is just unicorn jujitsu PDX. That's Instagram. And just on Facebook, I'm just Hillary Van Ornum. But if you friend request me and I don't accept it, it's because I don't know if you're a real human. <laughs> I've noticed an alarming uptick in fake Facebook requests recently. I hope that this is not an ongoing trend, but it's gotten a lot worse in the last year. Well, it's it's always kind of been bad for women, especially like combat athletes. Like, yeah, there's some random people. And if it's I look at like your the mutual friends and if it's all female jujitsu people and you're a dude, no. <laughs> or if you're selling, you know, fine gi products made by show your role and you know like i think as a gym owner you get extra spam from oh yes your manufacturers <laughs> <laughs> i i do love those i mean i appreciate the hustle when i get those emails but i really don't need a shipment of 200 custom geese to my house i'm okay for now thanks guys yeah yeah <laughs> Awesome. Well, again, thanks everyone for checking us out. And of course, if you want more of this, if you want to check out our premium series, uh, get some direct coaching from myself and the team. Best way to do that is to check out BJJ Mental Models Premium. You can get that at premium.bjjmentalmodels.com. There's a free trial so you can check it out. And if it's not what you wanted, no harm done. Again, please do consider giving it a shot. Premium.bjjmentalmodels.com. Hillary, thanks again so much for coming by. Fun chat as always. Looking forward to talking to you again sometime. I thought this was a good one. Thanks. Awesome, thanks. And of course, to everyone else who hangs out with us here, thanks again for listening. Talk to you guys next week. 